Hello, David. Oh, hi. Simon, <laughs> lovely to meet you. Thank you very much for this. This is, uh, wow, well, this is quite something. Yes. Um, yes. How, how do you go about starting to to build one of these? Where do you get well, the, the designs and plans and, uh, and the like? This is a copy of a French instrument which was made in the middle of the 17th century. And it's in the Boston Museum of Arts. Oh, right. And they have got various people to make a detailed survey of it. And I buy that survey from them. So I have the plans, uh, lots of information. And um, the bits that are, are not in their information, I can fill in because I've already made another two or three of this type. I see. So right. I, I know what's what. And um, the woods that are used are the woods that the original maker used, which are um, walnut. I was going to say the main body is... That, that's walnut. walnut is it? And the, walnut the framework, is that all in...? The framework is in poplar. Oh, right. Uh, they use poplar or pine. Um, poplar is very commonly used, and I prefer it to pine. It's very light, it's very strong, it's quite tough. Yes. Has it got a, a, a denser grain in, in pine? Uh, not really, it's a different kind of grain, it's more even. Right. Uh, but it, it's quite easy to work and it's very reliable. Um, it's difficult to get pine of the quality today that you need for this kind of work. Is this because they're too, they, it's too fast growing and so they're... That's right, the big old pine trees which are suitable for that sort of work are found very rarely now. Right. In Russia you can get them but that's about it. <laughs> right. Um, so, um, walnut and poplar for the casework, and the machine part of it, the action as we call it, yes, um, has a, a plate made of lime wood. You take this out, and you can see. This is a keyboard. Oh, wow. And it has a frame of poplar. Right. And on that frame there's a plate of lime wood, which is very stable and cuts very nicely. Right. And it's all mapped out on that plate of wood, and then it's cut. Right, I a, see. A saw. So the whole, so you start off that as one, of one piece. A whole piece. Yes. And then and this ebony covering is glued onto that whole piece. So the first cut on the keyboard cuts out all the keys with the ebony on. Right. And these sharp keys, as they're called, the underneath you put a piece of paper on so the ebony doesn't stick. Right. And when you cut it out, the ebony flips off here. Yes. Leaving room to glue this block of ebony. Lovely which is topped with bone. I was going to ask about whether that was... Cause no, it's not ivory. Um, they used bone originally, and in fact in France they still process bone for making things like buttons and so on. Right. And uh, this bone comes from France, ready processed for me to shape and glue onto the sharp blocks. Fantastic. So you don't have to go through all the process of uh, boiling down the bones and... Uh... I don't, no, no. All I have to do is <laughs> shape it and polish it. Wow. I think boiling down raw bones is very smelly and a long yes, job. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is uh, absolutely remarkable. So for all the little holes and things, do you do you make up a jig for the for the whole thing? Well the, the holes are marked out on the plate and the plate is drilled out um, on a platform yes. with a drill that moves about. Right. Uh, or you can move the plate about. So, but all the drilling is done before? All the drilling is done before it's parted. Yes. And it's a two-step process. There's a small hole that goes right to the bottom and a larger hole, which allows these pins to I see, yes. rock on the key to rock on the pin. And at the far end, it's guided by a slot cut in here accurately with a metal drill right, in the end. Yes. Wow. And all the keys are weighted with small lead weights, so that each key moves with an exactly equal pressure 
Oh, uh, it's like yeah. by balancing it on the knife edge. So all the keys are balanced, cut a bit off, right. put a bit of lead in, and, and so then on. individually weighted. So, so that they all balance very carefully. They balance so that they just fall forward. Right. And then with the weight of the action that plucks the string, because it's plucked rather than hammered. Oh yes, 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 yes. Um, there are little things called jacks that go on the top of there. And they're made of wood. And they have a slot here. Oh, yes, yeah. And into that slot, I'll get one with a piece in. They used to use birds' quills. Yes. But uh, you can still use bird quills. I, I use um, free range turkey if people want it. <laughs> right. Uh, Get a nice meal from you it. You can't do that shooting <laughs> ravens now. Um, uh, instead, uh, uh, plastic is used, uh, plastic called Delrin, which lasts much longer than quill. Yes. And it is carefully scraped to get the right pluck. I was going to say, does it make the say, is there a, a, a difference in tone? I think the listeners don't hear a difference, but the players can feel a difference. Right. The elasticity is slightly different. I see. And some players like the feel of quill. Yes. But most um, are quite happy with Derwin because they don't have to keep replacing the broken plate. Yes. yes. So that sits on here. And it goes up and down like that. Right. And on the way up it plucks, ding. And on the way down, that escapes um. against a hair spring at the back. Yes. Now they used to use pig's bristles, uh, but we now use uh, something like nylon. Right. Wow, that's remarkable. So each each one of these as well is individually and Painstakingly. Well, you make these on a jig. Right. Uh, you, you have a piece of wood which you slot all ah, the way along. Yeah. And then you slice them off. Right. But they still have to be very carefully finished. Yes. And the little rocking piece of wood in the middle, which is made of holly. Oh, right. Uh, it's a cheesy sort of wood, so that you can make these tiny slots without it splitting. Ah, yes. And that sits in a body which is made of pear wood. Right, because that takes a very, very, very smooth finish. You don't even need to polish it. It's oh, really? almost polished when you've planed it carefully. So they slide up and down in the slots made for them uh, very easy, easily and very, very quickly. And so do these just, they're not attached no. to the end? They're just... Um, if you just let me get you a piece of other... Uh, anatomy of the instrument. I can show you what happens. There are two layers to the action, which I can do this to show you. This layer of wood is covered with fine calf leather. Yes, right. And it has oversized holes cut underneath. Right. And exactly the right size holes are then punched from this side in, into the leather. I see. And that produces a slot. And the jack rides in that slot and it's totally silent. So you don't get any racket from the action of the instrument. So that goes through and it sits like that. The bottom one holds it there, and the top one holds it in position at the top. Lovely. So you get a key going up and down, and the jack rides in the leather slot, as you can see. Yes, yes. And so, bing, on the way up, and on the way down as it escapes. You, you don't actually hear it when you're playing, that's a return, unless the player holds them down until the sound has almost died. Yes. Then when he takes his hands off, there's a, a click. Right. But that's all part of the sound of the instrument, so you don't bother about that. No. You, no. Don't, you don't want a huge zing and a whack. You no. Know, but a nice click is what <laughs> you get. Now, so, is there any, looking at the, the, the keys here, um, 
compared to a piano keyboard, mm -hmm. obviously the, the, the first thing you notice is the reversal of the colours. Is that yes, just that, a design thing or all harp to chords? Um, in France particularly, and sometimes in Italy, in France they reverse the colours almost universally. Right. Um, and the different countries or the different schools of making had the, the commonest um, material on the keyboards, which in France was ebony and bone. In Italy they used boxwood, which is a pale yellow hardwood. Right, yes. And black or rosewood or ebony keys without the bone on the top, so that this yes. contrast was there more or less like on a modern piano. In the Low Countries, where they made fine harpsichords, they had um, bone on here, and instead of ebony, which was very difficult for them to get hold of, they used bog oak, which is almost black. Right, yes. So that was their material. They, they used ma the materials that were available, yes. and which they found were the best in their circumstances. And that's what I do. I, I copy yeah. their use of materials. Absolutely. Um, and and then, uh, does the bone, as ivory ages, it gets yellows down a lot? Does, does the bone have the same... It doesn't go particularly yellow, but what happens is that the little pores in the bone, right. which ivory doesn't have, yes. they gradually get dirty, so they become speckled. Right. I and see. it has a rather nice antique effect. Yes. Uh, and they stay very shiny and they last for a very long time, I mean hundreds of years. Well, yes. Because uh, there, there are extant instruments that still play from every school of instrument making, which is very good for us. Yes. Because yes. Um, the people who've done research have found out you know, what works and what, what, what works, <laughs> how they did it. Because when the harpsichord was reinvented, so to speak, there were no notes or drawings or anything at all. And the thing was handed to the piano makers, who, of course, had a technological approach. And they produced harpsichords which were beautifully made with very intricate um, machinery, mm -hmm. uh, beautifully made in metals and with all kinds of adjusters and things on them. And they didn't work <laughs> as well as these, because this is 400 or four and a half hundred years of uh, empirical judgment yes. from the dynasties of makers. Yes, you know? yes. And it does work best, there's no doubt about it. That's it. If it, if it ain't broke, don't yeah, fix it. That, that's right. <laughs> yes. It's not a question of you know going back, oh, it used to be better in those days. Um, it's, it's not a kind of, um, what's the word? It's not a nostalgia, it's actually practical. Yes. Mm. No, lovely, beautiful. Hello, David. Oh, I'm Simon. Hello. Really <laughs> lovely to meet you. Wow, this is uh, quite something. This is absolutely remarkable. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you get started on a project like this? Yes, well, the, <clears throat> the first thing I have to have is an, an order or a commission. Oh, right. They're all for specific I, I make, customers. Yes, I make um, instruments for uh, professional players and um, sometimes for higher companies. Uh, who hire out instruments for concerts. Right. And um, once I've got a commission, they tell me what kind of instrument they want. And I then say whether I would like to build it or not. Yes. Because it depends how much information I can get. So right. Whether I can make a really good job of it. I see. So they're all based on historical they're models. Out, yes. And... They're all based on historical models in collections in various places. Right. Germany the USA, UK, and the museums that have them, or the collections that have them, usually have two or three instruments in their collection which have been very, very, very detailed, surveyed in great detail by professional draftsmen and so on. And so they will sell you their records yes. if you want to make a copy. Right. And that's what I do. This particular instrument is in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts and it's a French 17th century instrument. Right. Um, and I'm making it for a professional player. 
Lovely. Have you been to the actual museum and seen the no, original? No, I haven't. But they sent me their, all the details that right. they had. Yes. And I've actually made a couple of instruments of this school of making. So any little oddments um, I can fill in from my previous experience. Right, yes. Uh, and you always have to do that. But if, if you've looked at a lot of old instruments and built a lot of copies, you then have a very good idea of how to deal with the bits that you haven't got direct information right. on. And do you use all the same skills and techniques that they would have used in the 17th century? Well, I use the same hand tools, right? and I use the same materials. Um, this, the walnuts and the poplar, for the case for the casework is is what would be used in France at that time. Yes, um, and also the action is made with the traditional woods because we know that they work best. They've got four hundred years of dynasties of instrument makers behind them who realise what's the best way to what do it. What works and what don't. Yes, absolutely. And of course, the musicians of the day were very fine musicians. Their playing skills were extraordinary. So you have to produce an instrument that works well even 500 years ago yes and they still on that pattern work very well for the best players as long as you make them well <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely beautiful how do you how do you go about getting the curves in, well, the, in the in the wall yes. is it a steam bend process that you use there are a number of ways um the old makers um used to soak them for a very long time and then bend them over a frame to dry out right uh, they used to soak them and then hold them over a fire till the wood became pliable right. and then bend it over a frame or even nail it on when it was still oh, really? pliable. Um, and in fact, in the Low Countries, in Holland, this part of the instrument, if you get through the paint, in, which has been done in restorations and so on, you find the wood is charred from being held over the fire and they just taken off the loose charcoal, right. painted over the top. One of those works perfectly well. One of those jobs that you don't want yes. to uh, walk away from whilst That's it's uh, going. <laughs> they're also often, if there's no charcoal, they're often thinner here. Right. Which was, it was thought that that was some technique for improving the sound, but no, it's not. It's where the charcoal Just... was scraped. <laughs> 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 so we were caught out on that one. Right. Um, I don't use, I, I think, some late instruments were laminated. I use a process which is light lamination. I have a reasonably thick board which is then scored with a saw right all the way along yeah. in short sections so that you've got a series of blocks still attached to a thin face. Yes. And it's actually this side that's cut, right. so that when you bend it, it, it closes up. Yes, yes. And that's put over a frame with another layer of wood, and they're glued together I see. in the bent position. Yes. And then there's a cap put on so that the uh, saw marks don't show. Right. So that's so you've got a, a, a veneer on this side, or is it thicker than a veneer? It's a lot thicker than a veneer, but uh, it's basically the idea. Yes. Right. The the uh, the saw marks go up to where the curve stops, basically. Yes. And with a very slight curve, right. you can just clamp the wood down and it stays in position where it's good. That allows me to get the exact curve that I need from the plan. Right. Because that particular curve is important. Yes. Uh, in the different schools of making, the way they set the instrument out means that they have a very typical curve. Right, and I suppose with any time I've done steam bending, you get a mm. bit of spring back after when you've taken it out of its clamps and things. So is that something that, with you're, this technique, you where you put allowed, it and glued, you you allow for that? Right, you over bend it slightly, and when it, you just get to know how to do that through. Yes, I was going to say that. When you uh, take it off, it's it's usually just about there. You can push it into place. Is this only a movement of maybe a quarter of an inch? Right. Or so? But I presume, because I presume on a, an instrument mm. such as this with strings that are on, mm. under tension, mm. any sort of tension that's coming off that, if that's not the right thing, is going to affect. It's not so much that. The frame is strong enough to hold the tension of the strings, which is not very great. A grand piano, modern grand piano, 
has a, a total tension in excess of 20 tonnes, which is why they have a cast steel rod. Right. Uh, on one of these, the total tension is around about half a ton. Oh, right. Uh, the strings are much, much thinner than camera strings. Right. Um, I mean, the, the thickest string on one of these is thinner than the th thinnest piano string. <laughs> and um, because the tension is evened out across the whole frame, the whole idea of the frame is that it's built to take this tension evenly. And of course, it, it will withstand it quite well. Yes. Um, they do move because they're made of wood, but uh, that's not a problem. No. Uh, I mean, they move a little bit. Yes. And looking in, in here, the, these pieces of uh, curved timber that you've got there, I can see joints yes. and things. So is that it? That's a, a that, cut and spliced? That goes, uh, this is part of the structure of the sounding board here. All ah, right. So uh, the heart and soul of the instrument. Right. And these were sometimes bent by steam. If it was a thin bridge, the strings go over a bridge like the bridge on the piano or right. the bridge on the violin. Yes. And it's a long bridge because it's got to take the full width of the of instrument. Of course, yeah. yeah. And if it's a thin one, you bend it like that and you hold it on the, on the glued surface with pit pairs of pins, pairs of dressmaker's pins, which is what they did. Right. Um, but if it's a thick member, you know, not, not very pliable wood, then you have to saw it out. But of course, you can't saw right round a curve without a, a lot of wasted wood. Yes. Or, as you go round like this, the grain is running like that. At this end, it becomes very short. Yep. And it's liable to crack. Very, yes. So you join it up. Right. There are two joints in this yes. one. There's one there. Beautiful. Cool, you wouldn't. You can hardly go. Yes. Hardly see it. And there's another one there. Right. Yes. And this is poplar again? This is poplar again. That goes underneath the belly of the instrument. Right. To hold one of the sets of pins that the strings hook onto. Beautiful. I can show you later on how this assembly works when, when we look at the sounding board. Lovely, lovely. The bridges that hold the strings are, in this instrument are walnut because that's what the original one has. And it actually is very good for bridges. I've used it in a lot of instruments. Wow. But, uh, it works well. Talk me through this instrument here. This is, uh... Yes, it's, um, it's an old um, French violin and cello makers gauge because they have to thin their soundboard so very carefully so you, as you work you slip the soundboard in here and I'll do it on this one like that and you gauge the thickness to within a tenth of a millimeter fantastic and this is fortunately big enough to reach the middle of my soundboard right. by just going round and round the edges. And so what sort of, um, you say it was an old French tool, what sort of age? This one, I would guess, uh, it was made in France in probably the 1920s. Right. Fantastic. And still working as good as it did? Perfectly. Yeah, absolutely perfectly. Yeah, so the action of the instrument, which plucks the strings from the player using the keyboard, works this way. You've seen how the thing is made and how the individual keys rock yes. on a, a pin. And just above this level, inside the instrument, is this strip of wood which has glued to it fine calf leather, which I mentioned before. Yes. And it's got slots punched in the leather over oversized wooden holes. And this, called a jack, this slides up and down against the leather, right. which is silent. Yes. So they go into the bottom one via one at a higher level, 
these are called guides and the two sets of guides hold these jacks right. in position and if I press the key you can see that jack going up and down in its yes. slot. Yes. And so the whole thing is held in by gravity, it's not attached onto the... No, it's not attached at all, it's held by gravity. So it has to have a very close fit so it doesn't rattle. It has to have very smooth wood, as I mentioned. Yes. So that it goes up and down easily. And the thing is, the amazing thing is, with what looks fairly primitive, but which is very carefully made, the best players can play with complete ease, however rapid the music is. And some 16th century music is unbelievable. The fingerings are just a complete race, you know, it's <laughs> right up and down the keyboard. And this action, when it's properly made, will take any player at any speed. Right. And seeing trills and everything. I see they're all individually numbered here. Yes, and the jacks are numbered as well. So the jacks are specific to each key. Yes, because when you um, set the instrument up and even out the pluck and all that kind of thing, there are minor differences across the instrument because, of course, it's all made of natural material. So there are very minute dis differences. I'm talking about fractions of a millimetre. Right. But a fine player can feel those differences and you have to even them out. Right, yes. So if you've got number 24, just as you want it, it's no good putting it in, say, number five, because that has a thicker string anyhow. Right. And all the measurements for that are minutely different if it's going to work properly. Fantastic. Wow. And this is the bridge, uh, like the bridge on a violin, or right. a piano, or, or a guitar. And the strings cross this and are held in position by pins in the top of it. And when the string vibrates, in close contact with this, this in turn transmits the vibration to the soundboard, right. which radiates the sound so that you can actually hear the strings making a musical sound. If you only had the strings, there's a tiny, tiny sound because they're so thin they hardly move any air. Right. And it's a question of getting movement to a volume of air so that it's carried through and, and to your ears. Um, and that's how it works. It's, it's not an amplifier in the electrical sense, it's a radiator right. sound. Right, yes. And it's absolutely vital, of course, that it's made in a certain way uh, with the right sort of wood in order to get the tone that you want. The voice of the instrument is very important and you can only get that with the right materials and very careful setting out of everything and then very careful voicing because yes. you have to get all those plectra right. working right so that the vibration comes through and makes a beautiful sound. Absolutely, so I suppose there's no point in having made the casing and everything <coughs> perfectly and out of all the right materials. Mm. If that's wrong, the rest of it is... Well, yes, I mean, that can all work perfectly, but if you don't get the right sound, which has happened, you've got to try and find out what the problem is. And just occasionally in a long career, you have to take the whole soundboard out right. and make another one, and because you can't really quite work out what's gone wrong. Right. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> Even Stradivarius. All of Stradivarius's violins are good. Many of them are unbelievably magnificent. Right. But he did, for him, make some which were not as good as the others. Oh, really? So yeah. occasionally you come, you come across a bad well, Stradivarius? No, they're not bad. Not bad. Relative <laughs> to the best one. Right. Because he also experimented a lot. I mean, this is how they found out. He, he changed his designs and he tried different thicknesses and thinnings of the... the he was experimental and, of course, a great craftsman which is why his violins, yes. amongst others, are so sought after. Absolutely, yes. But there are modern instruments which are just as good. There are very, very fine modern violins, there's no doubt about it. Um, on, a, on a par with the Stradivarius? Yes. They will be. 
um, age does seem to do something. Right. But I know they have tried playing behind a screen. They've done it with harpsichords as well. Modern, best copies. Yeah. And the originals. And every time, if they can't see the instrument, they don't they actually don't. know which is the best one. And some of them, in fact, have preferred modern ones. Uh, it's very interesting because the player doesn't know what he's playing either. Oh, really? Uh, they get professional violinists. Yes. They blindfold him and they put a peg on his nose because an old violin smells different right. from a new one. Yes. So they can't tell. What they do, the, the professional player does, it, how does it feel? And I think they found Stradivarius feels very, very good, but the best modern ones also feel good. Right. The other thing, of course, is that Strads now are not the same as when they were first made. The neck is different, the angle is different, the strings are made of different material. Ah, uh, yes, but right. Because it's a very beautiful sound box, whatever you do to it, you get it's a fine sound. Yes. And it's the same thing. I mean, there are a few makers um, who make instruments that sound, or will sound, just as good as the best of the old makers. Yes. I fondly yes. hope that one or two of mine might do. Well, I'm sure, yeah, <laughs> I'm absolutely sure. <laughs> right. Um. I'll just put those two in, give you the idea. And I'll tell you the materials as we go along. Isn't lovely, it? lovely. Okay. This is the heart and soul of the instrument, the soundboard, which is the equivalent to the belly of a violin or the front of a guitar. Right. Yes. And it radiates the sound that the strings make when they're plucked. Right. Now, without the soundboard, you just get a very, very tiny sound from the strings. Right. And it doesn't amplify it, it, it radiates it. It vibrates in time with the string and the sound is then transferred to the air around you and you hear it. Right. So if that's not correct, the it's, instrument won't... Yes. I mean, it has to be, it, as I say, it is the heart and soul. It's made of spruce, Christmas tree wood. Right, yes. But it's very special spruce in that it grows in the Alps, high up, so that it grows slowly. Right. And it comes from very big trees, uh, trees with a huge trunk, some of them are two or three hundred years old. So it's very, very controlled because these trees are protected. And there are only a certain number of woodcutters in Europe who cut these trees and cut them up for the musical instrument trade. Right. So this stuff comes from Italy and the trees are from the same slopes as people like Stradivarius. Right. So it's the violin fronts from. Uh, so it's very finely grained, it's a very old tree. It's very carefully s uh, selected by the cutters. They know what trees are going to provide the wood that you need, to, up to a point. Yes. And when they've cut it, they then grade it. So you get first and second grades and third grades. Right. And the first grade wood, which you want if you're well into your instrument making, is uh, naturally very expensive. Yes. So it produces the goods. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's what this is, this is grade? This is grade A, the grade first a. one. Right. Yes. And of course, when you get into fine, particular small pieces for violins and cellos, which are cleft rather than sawn, they're split, so right, the yes. grain runs evenly through them. Uh, you, 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 for a fine front for one of these, you could pay a couple of thousand pounds. Right. But then I presume from that there's a lot of what you, you know, you may only get one one piece from a whole tree if it's well, that cleft. Well, I, I, I don't really know. It's a specialist trade. Yes. I don't know how many violin fronts they would get, but I know that they grade them very, very carefully and then they keep them. I keep this for a long time, right? Uh, several years before I use it, so that it has time to settle, if you Completely, like. Absolutely, uh, yes. Stresses and so on. I, 
I suppose it's not so much as it settles, but I know what it's going to do. Yes. Because if it's not done anything much after that time, it's, it's going to be okay. I mean, I presume it would be disastrous if you went made made your soundboard and then it had a, a slight bit of movement in it. It would be you'd have to start again then from. Yes, I mean it's also selecting the wood. Um, you can select it by tapping it, and you can tell by the way it rings. Uh, if it sounds like a piece of old leather, yes. then it's no good at all. Right. Uh, but what you hear in a good piece of wood is several layers of response, if you like. Right. And length of response, so that it rings for a longish time. And in a big piece, you'll get high notes and low notes all at the same time. Right. So it's, it's responsive, if you like. And again, I presume that's down to knowing it's, what it's ex experience it's, and it's not a magic it's just having done it a lot yes you think that oh, this one's going to be all right and it usually is you get surprises there <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> not too many though i, I imagine <laughs> yeah. you'd hope for <laughs> uh, i mean this is i talk of course to other makers uh, and in other parts of the world we all have the same experience you know things are not perfect all the time no no uh, occasionally in your career you have a real disaster that you've got to put right. <laughs> yes. um, so this is soundboard is in the process of being thinned. Right. Because having got the right sort of wood and having glued up all these pieces edge to edge, they start out at about um, six or seven millimeters thick. Right. And then you have to thin it by hand and some areas are thicker and some areas are thinner and how you do this depends very much the quality of the sound all other things being equal so at this end where the big long strings are yes the soundboard is thicker in the middle now when i say thicker that's about 3.5 millimeters right just over an eighth of an inch right and then out towards the edges it gets thinner and near the shorter strings it gets in there. So in this sort of area here, you're talking about three millimeters thick. Wow. And then right in the corners, in order to keep the whole soundboard responsive, uh, as it were on light springs, yes. it's thinned right down at the corners to about uh, 1.9, two millimeters. I mean, you're talking in tenths of a millimeter wow. to do it accurately, yes. and carefully. I mean, we're, so this is the original, that's, you're talking there, that's the, your five or six mil. Yes, that's right, and that will be taken down to three mil because this area is um, damped anyhow by right. a, a structure underneath it. And over here, where the very shortest strings are, again, it thins thin down to about 1.9, wow. two millimetres. So it's an extremely delicate piece when it's when it's finished well when it's, it's glued in, in right it's, it's actually uh, very you know it's safe yes it's totally safe um there are instruments where the soundboard is still in perfectly good order after three or four hundred years wow. italian ones uh low countries instruments instruments built in 1620 and so on still playing Fantastic. not many but <laughs> you, you'd be surprised how you know, people think oh, it must be like bone china. It's not. They're, they're really quite robust in spite of the uh, delicacy of right. setting them up. Yes. So what I've done is underneath the soundboard, I've just put it on top to show you what happens. But underneath, if you look through, shone a light from under, you see this. These bars hold this area flat. And to some extent, dampen the response right yes this is underneath and there are a whole set of little pins in here that hold the short set of strings there are three sets of strings on this instrument two long sets yes which have more or less the same sound and a short set which are an octave higher a whole scale higher right so the the, the long strings sound Mm, and the short strings sound mm, oh, up there. Yes, yeah. So that's the underneath, which is 
again has to be very carefully placed yes. because on the top the bits that hold the strings which are called bridges as in the violin yes. or as in a guitar the bridges hold the two sets of strings that one is cut to size with joints yes. again. Yes. Um, the joints, uh, there's a joint. No, there isn't. No, there is. Well, I, I join them together with matching grains, so it's yes. actually quite so hard to find them once they've been joined up, but there are a couple of joints in this somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and that's sawn out and shaped. Beautiful. Um, with various kinds of shades, you know, yes. spoke shades yeah. and things like that. And this is the bridge for the short strings, which in this particular instrument is very tiny. And that's just bent to shape, like that, goes about there. And it's held in position while it's glued by pairs of dressmaker's pins. Right. You set the pins out on the curve, you pop this in between all the yes. pins, and that's held by things called go bars, which are upstairs. I've got a big frame, and a go bar because you can't get cramps that go right in the middle. You brace it with a piece of wood that bends like that. Ah, right, to get a bit of it down. Yes. You've got a whole row of these, about 12 or 15 on a bridge, holding it down while the glue dries. Right. And the same with this one. This is also held with pairs of pins not to keep its shape but to stop it from sliding with when the go bars are on otherwise it would go yes, yes, while yes. the glue is still wet and um, once these are on the, the bottom boards go on first the bottom bars i should say mm -hmm. um, that also has a, an interesting technique because with this wood being so thin it changes with the weather so in damp weather right. it swells yes. and in dry weather it shrinks and what you don't want for is, is for it to crack right. when it's dry. No. Although in modern um, recording studios they do often crack because of the lights right. which are really sort of oven roasting. Yes. And there are endless stories. I've had it happen to me twice you get a whole lot of bright lights bearing down on the players and the instruments and suddenly halfway through a recording there's a pistol shot <laughs> ah, and it's the soundboard. It doesn't alter the sound of the instrument, just releases the tension. Right. And unless, oh, so you can still play? Oh, you can still play, yeah. Um, unless the, if the crack is just a, a clean crack, it makes no difference to the sound. It's, if the crack touches and buzzes, that's a different uh, matter. Right. Or if it, if one side goes dip below the other, then you've got a big restoration job coming cool. up. But mostly they just crack and you fill the crack up. Right. By the time they've come out of that studio, the crack's gone. Yes, yes, yeah. So you have Flows to back up again. blow it with a hairdryer to open it up and then... Right. In order to avoid that, because modern instruments are really very badly treated compared with old ones. The, aristocracy bought these instruments. They kept them in one room on the north of the building against a cool wall. Right. And they stayed there for their lifetime. Yes. So... Not moved around from recording studio to concert a, hall. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing how um, how they do stand up to modern usage because they're, they're... I've made several instruments for hire companies and they're hawked around all over London or taken by lorry to Edinburgh for players from overseas who can't bring their own instruments, right. you know. So um, here we have the two bridges and um, oh, I was going to say that the bottom supporting bars go on first when this is very dry. In the old days they waited for a dry day. Right. Uh, and they could measure whether it was a dry day by having a strip of wood across the grain and seeing how much it has shrunk. Ah. And that's the day they would put the soundboard in. Right. Um, I don't have several men working, <laughs> and I don't have that sort of time. 
So I have a dehumidifier upstairs where I do the gluing. Right. And I dry that top place out down to about 42% moisture. And that's when the bottom bars are glued on. Right. And I keep that moisture content in the air until the glue is set. Right. I suppose with the way uh, the English weather is at the moment as well, you'd be waiting, right. you could be waiting a few years for the so right temperature. Then <laughs> I have to put the top bars on, these, the bridges, and the bridges go on in a damp atmosphere. Oh. Because when the bottom bars are on and it's dry, yes. it's flat. Right. When you take the go bars off and the glue is dry, and the humidity rises in the room, it has to expand against the cross grain of these, and wood will not expand on its length. So what it does is it forces itself up, so that you get a slight curve. Right. As the top of the soundboard expands, yeah, it curves upwards. Right. Yes. Come and convex. These are glued on in a humidity of about, I think I do it at 60%, I've got a table somewhere. Right. So that there's a differential between the bottom bars and the top bars going on. This means that when it's in the instrument, in damp weather it rises. Yeah. And that maintains the down pressure of the strings, so you get a good sound. In dry weather it goes flat, but not completely flat. Right. So it rises up and down with the weather, but it never dishes, because that would ruin the sound. Yes. And it, you hope that it never rises quite as far as it will touch the strings. Right. But I have had that happen. Oh, Somebody right. had an instrument, and for reasons I don't know, they kept it in a damp cellar for about three months. And of course, when they get it out, the strings are slapping against the yeah. soundboard where yeah. it's bulged right up like a balloon. <laughs> and it takes a lot of trouble to get to get it flat again. Yeah. Anyhow, that's the, the soundboard wow. business. And when that's got all its pieces on, it goes into the instrument in a dry atmosphere. Right. And that means that it does this proper yes. rising and falling. Wow, there's a quite a, mm. quite a science to it all that you, there is. the layman never never finds out well, about. Yeah, I mean, it's like all trades. It's, it's a trade. Yes, yes. And it's not magical or secret. You just have to learn it from other makers. Um, and the old makers, of course, had worked this out a long time yes. ago. Not yeah. scientifically, but uh, by experience. Yes. No, fantastic. Well... David, thank you very much indeed. It's been extremely interesting. Okay. Thank you so much.